Superhero Stuff You Should Know is part of the Greenlit Podcast Network. Hey, this is Ben from Superhero Stuff You Should Know, and I have an important announcement for you guys. At the end of every single episode of Superhero Stuff You Should Know, you might hear a shout out to our fans, one of whom is Matt Herring, who was one of the original Superhouse fans. He's always given us his support, and now it's time that we support him. Uh, we've just recently found out that Matt has been diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer. And as a cancer survivor myself, I know personally that there's a lot of emotional and financial strain that comes into that. Uh, his wife, Kelly, has set up a GoFundMe account at GoFundMe.com slash F slash Matthew hyphen kicks hyphen cancer 039 S hyphen butt. Uh, and hopefully you can help reduce the financial strain to that as well as some of the emotional strain that comes with that. Again, that's GoFundMe.com slash F slash Matthew dash kicks dash cancer 039 S dash butt. Matt Herring was the first, I guess you could say, true Superhouse fan. We were Superhouse at that time. You know, the first fan of this podcast and what we do here and um, has always supported us, talked about us, and um, he's from a town close to where I'm from, and uh, so we share that as well, and just a huge superhero fan, and, you know, nerd like the rest of us, and now he's going through that, and uh, if you could donate just at least any amount of money to that link that Ben just said, that would be truly appreciated just hang in there matt you'll beat this thing soon clark i think it's about time that i tell you how robin came into my life specifically the way that his parents were murdered yeah okay uh uh bruce about that um i don't i don't care about that as much as uh the booty shorts and the pixie boots, Bruce. What's going on with that? You see, what happened was there was this guy named Boss Zuko, and he was trying to extort them over at the circus. And Did he shoot the kid's pants off? What happened? Clark, you need to understand something. I really value costumes and still fear into the criminal element. And still fear? No, you know, fear is not really my thing, but I just, I just don't know, Bruce. In my mind, nothing strikes fear than the sight of two pale, white legs coming towards you. The way you think sometimes, Bruce, it mystifies me. I also thought green pixie boots would strike fear whenever you saw them coming at you. It definitely strikes something. The kid's not Kryptonian, right? He, If I shot those legs, it, it would not bounce off. No, but he knows a lot of sweet acrobatics. And you're rich enough, definitely, to buy a full pair of pants. Do you want to see my jeans collection? You have a lot of spare jeans, but none for the boy. Well, obviously not. It's not like my size could fit him. Come on, Clark. Okay, whatever. Um, hope things go well for you, Bruce. And, uh, and for the kid as well. Um, seems like a good guy. I'll see you later. No, thanks, Clark. There's no way he will ever be in danger or get killed by Joker violently in a warehouse explosion. Seeing that the future is not one of my powers, so uh, best of luck to you guys. Alfred, I just had an idea. Give the kid some green Speedos. Yes, fear. Right away, Bruce! Holy 80th anniversary, everybody. It's superhero stuff you should know, brought to you by Superhouse. I am, once again, Ben, the man who knows too much about Batman, and across the way is... It's Andrew, everybody. How's it going? So, we're not in the same room this time because we are in Los Angeles, and we've got some stay-at-home orders, and we're good little boys, aren't we, Ben? Yes, especially because <laughs> we follow the superheroes, so we figure that... Uh, <laughs> you know, especially after five episodes of Superman, we decided to be like Clark Kent and uh, obey at least what feels like the best course of action for our we're, area. We're stewards of the law. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's Batman, but yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> naturally, this year has been a year of many Shitty things. Shitty as fuck! <laughs> but it's been a very good year for us, at least. But it's also the 80th anniversary of three major Batman characters. 
Uh, what? Being those characters in chronological order would be Robin, Joker, and Catwoman. Now, we already did an 80th anniversary of the Joker in our crossover with Cryptic Campfire. Check it out. Called Is the Joker Supernatural? So go ahead and check that out. Uh, we obviously talked extensively about that character too when we were going over the Dark Knight versus the comics as well. So I think we covered Joker pretty well. And we're going to do our 80th anniversary of Catwoman at the end of the year. Uh, oh, so we'll shit. go into a little bit of that later. But this is our 80th anniversary special for Robin. And uh, to tell you the truth, I almost considered making our Jason Todd episodes the 80th anniversary, but it okay. didn't feel right. That's Jason because... Todd, man. We got to have all kinds of yeah. dick in this. Yeah, exactly. Because Jason <laughs> Todd hasn't been around for 80 years. Dick has. So Dick's been around for a long time. For a long time, and it's here to stay. <laughs> he's here to stay, I should say. <laughs> so Burt Ward's like, I know that's right. Which leads us into our episode. Which <laughs> dick is the? I mean, which Dick Grayson Robin origin is the best? You had it right the first time, man. Come which on. Which Dick is the best? Okay. Uh, so this episode covers Burt Ward's obviously, obviously, yes. <laughs> so this obviously covers specifically the Dick Grayson Robin spending two episodes. So this is part one uh, on the evolution of his origins. You need uh, two, at yeah. least, to cover it, the length how, of this yes. topic and girth as well. <laughs> It's going to be this the whole time, guys. Get uh, ready along, for it. Along with two Patreon episodes for you guys who are behind our pay, our paywall. So If you don't lot- like jokes about <laughs> Burt Ward's a massive ding-dang, <laughs> you're going to have to just press, press pa- pause, press stop now. <laughs> it's going to be an absolute barrage. Yes. Uh, so these episodes are going to cover all the different things. Cause at, at first, I was just like, okay. Robin's 80th anniversary, what are we going to cover? And I thought about the origins, and I'm like, that sounds like a nice, you know, one-hour episode. And then I started going into it, and I'm like, holy shit, there's there's so much. There's so much dick in this. <laughs> all the- <laughs> this is more than I'm used to. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So nobody can agree, it seems, on how Robin came into being in the Batman mythos, we have different ages of when he starts crime fighting. We have different ways that the Graysons dies. There's arguably more times or more variations on how the Graysons die than the Waynes die. The younger Robin is, the less dick jokes I'll make. <laughs> yes, yes. Less. Uh, there's different ways of how he meets Batman. Sometimes he meets Batman, sometimes he meets Bruce. Uh, and different explanations behind the name Robin and the costume. So. Okay. We're going to cover all that here. We're mostly going to cover the main continuity comics uh, that provided the significant changes uh, rather than every single instance or flashback that we see, you know, the Graysons fall to their deaths. Uh, and we're right. also going to cover all the major adaptations in media. So like film, TV shows, Batman Forever, BTAS, we're going to cover all that. Uh, okay. I want to save the Woo! unmade media ad- adaptations, so the stuff that didn't make it to, you know, Batman 89... Uh, as well as any obscure Elseworlds type shit, that goes into our Patreon. So if you guys are subscribers to that, you'll get that. Um, And then any of the leftover notes that I have, which are probably (laughs) another good, like, five pages or so, uh, will be into (laughs) another episode. He does it for you. He does it for you. I studied a lot of dick for this. So, (laughs) (laughs) When does it ever become not funny? (laughs) That's the question. (laughs) So first... (laughs) Before we start, I would like to go into our recent poll, as we've kind of done. Uh, Recently, we've been going... Poll. We've been asking people... uh, Yes. It's not that type (laughs) of poll. Come on. (laughs) This quarantine's getting to us, man. (laughs) Maybe some states are quarantining less, but we got it rough out here, man. (laughs) We might be talking about Robin, but this is not a kid's show. Yeah. Uh, for anybody who are, anybody who's wondering. Trust me, so, I mark I mark not for kids on YouTube every time. <laughs> we are so fucking got superhero in the name. Under We're explicit. Spotify. Yeah. Explicit every time. Uh, yes, it is true. Uh but our P O L L poll was about Lex Luthor cuz we did five episodes on Superman the movie and I asked was Gene Hackman a good Lex Luthor because very often you hear like Clancy Brown from Superman the animated series was, is the best or Michael Rosenbaum from Smallville is the best. But very rarely do you hear more about people talking about Gene Hackman because he's kind of been overshadowed by these other versions? So I had millennials. To so uh, I put this on Twitter and on Instagram. So on Twitter, we had sixty percent say yes, Gene Hackman was a good Lex Luthor, and forty percent say no. Uh, okay. On okay. Instagram, 
Instagram. Gene Hackman apparently has more fans on Instagram. Who knew? Uh, but oh. 88% said yes, he was a good Lex Luthor, and 40% said no on Twitter. I mean, Interesting. I yes. wonder what the age demographics of that those answers are, but I guess mm-hmm. we'll never know. No. That's interesting. We'll see. They feel like but, the older yeah. crowd that saw it in the theater probably liked Hackman. and I don't know. I think there's, there's probably an age thing going on there. Yeah, I mean, you, you do have to factor in the fact that this is a Lex Luthor who isn't the Clancy Brown version, who's not the corrupt businessman, charmer type of guy, but is more of the Silver Age mad scientist type who's kind of just more outwardly evil. So uh, you have to take yeah. that into consideration. What's, so I'm going through the animated series now for the first time, and mm-hmm. what's interesting to me is that like Lex is in a lot of the episodes, but he's just sort of in the background a lot of the time. He's kind of mm-hmm. low key evil, more you know what I mean? I don't know. He's yeah. not. He might be in episodes, but he's not the main villain often. Or he's Which is interesting. Yeah, he'll yeah. be associated with the villain. Maybe he's. I don't know. He's just not. It's interesting what they've done there. I. I don't know. I'm really. It's it's the, it's a good team that did it. Apparently, guys. Yeah. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> also, Who's Batman: Brave and the Bold. What the fuck? <laughs> yes. People talk about that more, please. That's a fucking yes. great show. Come on. Are you kidding I just, me? I just got Andrew on that. <laughs> yeah. I I had probably seen an episode a while ago, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I don't know. I got busy. I liked it. Probably. I mean, I haven't disliked any of them, but it definitely feels like a show that kind of like no one talks about anymore, and it's on HBO Max. Is it in our, our DC Universe at least? It's on DC Universe, but I hope it gets to HBO Max. It's just a really great, like, you know, almost variety show, you mm-hmm. know? There's Aquaman no, episodes and fucking Spectre <laughs> episodes. The Spectre yes. episode is fucking awesome, written by Deanie. Yes. Um, anyway, I've derailed this entirely, Ben. Let's go back to the scheduled program. <laughs> Let's go back to Dick. Back so. to the Dick, please. I need more Dick, please. <laughs> uh, so, okay, Robin... <laughs> Is arguably the more the most controversial figure out of the three whose 80th anniversary we're coming up here. Not just because of his name, uh, but because of the fact that some people don't think that Robin as a character should exist. A lot of fans think Batman is better as a loner. They think that he should work alone, or they feel that Robin's existence means that he's putting a child in danger, which is actually <laughs> uh, Denny O'Neill's feeling about Robin. I mean, uh, he may, it puts him in a red fucking suit at <laughs> night, makes him more easily seen than him. It's yes. not a good look. Yeah, and others think that he makes the Batman mythos feel lame or too light. I think a lot of that is the perception due to the 60s show. Uh, but my question for you, Andrew, is growing up or as an adult, were you ever a Robin hater? I was never a hater. Um, nice. I don't... How can I put this? I don't need him. Like in the Burton stuff, of course, all that. Like mm-hmm. he's Batman being a loner makes perfect sense, but mm-hmm. Batman like needing somebody also makes sense. But I, it is like, you know, we have to be careful in how we bring over things from the fucking golden age of comics. Like right. these were like little kid books, you know. Like we can enjoy mm-hmm. them as adults, but if we're talking brass tacks here, it's the, these were books for kids and, uh, they wanted, you know, to have the kids relate to Robin more than to Batman. So Robin's Robin's kind of like the kids avatar really. Right. That was original intention. Am I wrong about that? Uh, yeah. And we're actually going to go into a bit of that as well before we go into the comics. So just like the colors, the fucking like, you know, look like your picture there, the fucking legs being shown, fucking booties. <laughs> like, it's funny now, and I'm sure, I don't know what they were thinking at the time, but like, you know, some, how they update it is interesting and how we go forward. <laughs> like, maybe it's a very dark red, you know, I know people want bright mm. colors and shit, but right. if Batman's dark... Yeah, I don't know. Like, how realistic do we want it? Depends on the tone of that of that particular show. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you know, if Batman, if Robin's around, it's cool. And having the multiple Robins, which most casual Bat fans aren't even aware of, having right. them kind of like have their bickering going on is also more family drama. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's this is a mythos that's been, um, we, you know, America mainly America has been tinkering with over the past 80 years and so it's obviously going to be updating as we go along and uh yeah i'm not a robin hater at all long story short long story short yeah i think 
I personally feel that taking Robin or any of the Batman family out of the equation sort of dilutes Bruce as a character because ah. it's kind of like, okay, so he spends X amount of years in Gotham just fighting crime. Like, it just feels like his evolution as a character comes to a grinding halt without the parts about him becoming a mentor, parts about right, him learning right. to work with other people who aren't just, you know, Jim Gordon, all of those types of things, uh, as well as just the fact that there's this beautiful poetic turn where it's like he's here's a man who lost his family and sort of regains his own sense of family not the traditional part but a family made of people who he saved from the same trauma that he experienced and i don't think that's true very robin good batman explores that at all that's that is true actually yeah it's it, robin was batman's only good for the first few years of have his crime fighting right you got to get to this other level at some point yeah i right, think yeah, that's good yeah. that's that's good also, yeah. keeping in mind, uh, we'll get, we're about to go into the history of how Robin came about, but Batman shows up in May 1939 in our history. Robin shows up in April 1940. So 11 months into Batman's existence, Robin comes into this. A lot of people forget uh, that. Robin not is even very a year. quickly introduced, barely a year in. So technically, Robin shows up at the end of year one in Golden Damn. Age times. Not that that's think. interesting. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're you're 100 percent right. I think it's mainly. I think mainly it's the costume for a lot of people, especially the ca- <laughs> more the more casual Bat fan. It's well, you're it's, saying this doesn't strike fear into your heart. <laughs> I mean, it's great as a part of nostalgia. <laughs> like, I mean, I love that kind of like. What were they thinking? Like, it's something kind of like funny about that. Mm-hmm. You know, like fucking booties and shit. <laughs> <laughs> Just. Sh- Shoot Batman in the jaw and the kid, boots. the kid in the legs. You know, like it's just, it's just funny. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> Batman's like, Dick, I need you to not tan your legs because I need the paleness to blind the crime. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to go over there. You're gonna be the one to kind of call to them. Don't worry, I come in right after that. <laughs> right, right. Rob, I'm, I'm Batman. I'm gonna be there. <laughs> All right, so let's let's dive into how did Robin come about in the first place in our world, not yet in the world of the comics. Mm. And lo and behold, we have conflicting information on who first came up with the idea of giving <laughs> Batman a kid sidekick, just like we had conflicting information on who came up with parts of Batman lore. You'd but think that these- they would fucking... I know it wasn't as big <laughs> of a deal as it is now, right. but when you're dealing with like copyright and they're working for a company, mm-hmm. um, you know, what was it, National at the time before it was DC? Like, I think it was that's still, right. I mean, it was Detective Comics still. Uh, okay. At least the, the title was, but I'm not sure if the company was national yet. It was Let national. us know in the Mar- comments. I think Marvel was Timely Comics, if I'm mm-hmm. not mistaken, and yeah. DC was national. And, like, I could be wrong about that. But anyway, like, and so it's not like they weren't aware that this, I don't know, it just seems like they should have kept more track of who fucking made up, made who. <laughs> Drives yeah, me crazy. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, funny enough, both conflicts come from another one of Bill Finger and Bob Kane's collaborators, Jerry Robinson. So right. I have conflicting quotes from Jerry Robinson himself. Robinson told Les Daniels of Batman The Complete History that uh, it was Bob Kane's idea to give Batman a kid sidekick so that readers would, you know, young readers would identify with it. Uh, but in another book called Jerry Robinson Ambassador to Comics, he says Bill Finger came up with the idea. Weird. Okay. So he doesn't know. (laughs) Or he was contractually obligated to give credit to Bob first and then... Because the Ambassador to Comics book, I believe, came out after Mark Tyler Nobleman did this whole thing about trying to get Bill Finger credit. Uh, Okay. I might be wrong on the timeline of that, but it it feels like maybe Jerry was more free later on to say, like, okay, it was Bill Finger, actually. And Jerry Robin is definitely the one that created the Joker? Uh, who helped create the Joker, yeah. Helped, uh, okay. But Jerry, Jerry Robinson definitely contributed to the creation of Robin, as we're about to, to dive in. Okay. Uh, so first off, Robin is seen by many to be the first sidekick, but that's not quite true. In wow. 1932, Dick Tracy had an adopted son named Junior, who's played by Charlie Cosmo in the Warren Beatty movie. Uh, but Junior's been around since 1932, a good eight years before uh, Robin. Did the uh, Catholic but, League get on Junior's dick? At the time. No, because A, his name wasn't Dick, and B, <laughs> his legs weren't exposed with a fucking green Speedo on. He was just a regular street kid. 
He Burt wore no Ward costume. loves telling that story, bro. <laughs> loves it. Then again, uh, why not? Why not? I guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Bill Finger liked the idea. He felt that he needed a Doctor Watson, the Batman Sherlock, and he felt that it was more difficult to write Batman because he didn't have anybody to talk to. So this gave him somebody for Batman to talk to to make it a little easier. Uh, so yeah, because Alfred doesn't go out with him, right? Alfred so didn't even, exist at this time. Oh, Alfred's not even fucking around. Even if even if he did exist, he's yeah. not. He wouldn't be out there. Yeah. He wouldn't be out there with him. So yeah, this mm-hmm. it makes sense. Yeah. yeah, like how much of a lonely, sad bastard Batman do you want? You know, like we, <laughs> exactly. You know, like how how much mm-hmm. how much of that? Yeah. So yeah I, yeah, I could see I could see this. Yeah. So Bob Kane and Bill Finger, either one of them, they both come up apparently with this idea of a kid's sidekick, and their name for the sidekick is Mercury, the Boy Wonder. <laughs> So Mercury was going to be the name of the sidekick. Uh, of course, for those who are familiar with mythology, you know that Mercury is the Roman version of Hermes uh, and that Hermes is often seen with the helmet, with the wings on it, which yeah. in 1940 had already been given to Jay Garrick, the Flash, uh, a good couple of months around, I think, believe in January 1940. Uh, Mercury slash Mercury slash Hermes is mm-hmm. the Flash, basically, in Greek yeah, mythology. Or the yeah. Flash is Hermes, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Okay, so, so this is the problem we, here. We could have gotten Batman and Mercury directed by Joel <laughs> Schumacher in 1997. <laughs> so Chris O'Donnell is 45-year-old Mercury in this. But <laughs> instead... Since from silver drinking, <laughs> taking ro- ro- Chris Robin, O'Donnell. Mercury, okay. yeah. <laughs> but uh, so how did he go from Mercury to Robin? And that's where Jerry Robinson comes in. And uh, thanks to Jerry Robinson's son, we have a complete breakdown in terms of how that came about. Oh, wow. Okay. My dad's con- contribution was to model the costume after Robin Hood, whose tales he loved reading as a kid, and to suggest the name Robin rather than Mercury. My dad would often point to the inspiration of N.C. Wyeth's illustrations in The Adventures of Robin Hood, a childhood favorite of his. Right. So we get Robin because of Robin Hood inspiring Jerry Robinson. Interesting. I'm sure the fact fact that it's Jerry Robinson, you know, contributing to right. name Robin, you right, know, right, doesn't right. really uh, hurt his case either. Right. Uh, but he also felt, his main thing is that he felt Mercury is the name of a god. It's the name of what sounds like a superhero, somebody who's not one of us. Robin is a, a real name. Right. So it felt more human to him, especially for a character who doesn't have any superpowers and is helping out a guy who doesn't have any superpowers. Yeah, it's... Uh I don't know. Maybe we're culturally, you know, already biased towards it, but it just has a better ring to it, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Batman and Robin, <laughs> Batman, like Batman and Mercury. And Mercury. <laughs> Batman and Mercury sounds, t- you're getting too sci-fi, which Superman's already doing, and The Flash. Mm-hmm. Also, That's another thing. So, like, it being a more realistic thing, which Batman ultimately is compared to the other comics that he's yeah. associated with, uh, you know, it, that works on that level as well. Yeah, yeah. So Jerry Robinson, I believe, was the one then to go on and design the Robin costume inspired by, uh, as Andrew was saying, the N.C. Wyeth illustrations of Robin Hood, which is why it's so bright red and green, because that's how Robin Hood was illustrated. I find it interesting that they they never they they never really wanted to get him using a bow and arrow, I guess, huh? Not really. Uh, it's interesting that they're just like, yeah, let's because Robin does use a form of a weapon in his first appearance, but it's a slingshot. It's not a bow and uh, arrow or anything like that. You would think that would be interesting to have, like you know, Batman in his archer sidekick because this is before Green Arrow was around too. Yeah, so, so maybe it's it's not a knows. gun, but maybe it's too close to a. Well, Batman's using guns at this point, right? Uh, yeah, in a couple issues around this time, yeah. Every now and again, right? Okay, yeah. so um, yeah, all right, Who sure. Knows? Maybe. Well, it also, I guess, it hides their influence too a little bit if he's not using a bow and arrow. Yeah, but I feel you like know? it's excusable because of the fact that, like, okay, maybe he's just a modern Robin Hood as a kid. But yeah, who knows? Yeah. Um, Jerry Robinson also thought that uh, the R on the chest would be a nice counterpoint to the bat on Bruce's chest, so mm-hmm. we have him to thank for that as well. And uh, according to Golden Age historian and author Bill Shelley, Dick, the name of Dick, <laughs> comes from 
a popular dime novel character named Dick Merriwell, the half-brother to main character Frank Merriwell, who was basically a star athlete in a whole bunch of dime novels at the time in the 1930s. So, wow, okay. that's very deep cuts there. I have no, I don't know that much about Dick Merriwell, but uh, that's how... You don't how... know all about dime novels of the 1930s and 40s, Ben? No, especially not 1930s, <laughs> Dick. So, we well, have we're going to find out... <laughs> <laughs> what we have here is a very deep cut into why <laughs> that name came about. But that's actually according to our friend of the podcast, Andrew Farrago, who wrote uh, Batman, uh, the 80th anniversary giant uh, book that we did. And we did an yeah. interview with him uh, last year. I believe His that tone. was our, yeah, close to our uh, end of year episode last year. So it might man, have been our last episode. It's can't, can't believe we're, we're a year in. <laughs> it feels a like year that was from so long that. ago. Yeah. <laughs> We've God. definitely evolved. Uh, just... Over yeah, this year, over so. overall, yeah. Uh, but yeah, let's see. The, one of the publishers named Jack Leibowitz did not like this idea at all. He was skeptical skeptical of having this boy sidekick. He's like, you're basically endangering this child. This is not going to work. And then he shut up when sales of Detective Comics doubled when Robin debuted. It's the kid, man. They need they need a kid. Kids reading it. They need the Avatar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Know? It's no surprise later on that, you know, Jimmy Olsen was added to Superman. You've got Speedy to Green Arrow. You've got all the Teen Titans, Kid Flash to Flash. Like, it all stems from Robin. It's a kind of, um, you know, we talk about racial representation a lot, but this is a kind of, I guess, um, kid representation. As soon Mm -hmm. as they see themselves in the page, that's when... You know, it really went through the roof, I guess. So that's cool. Mm. That's, that's interesting. It's yeah. funny that Superman never really... I mean, it's Superboy, I guess, but I don't know. It just seemed it's like Batman and Robin seem so, you know, in the DNA of each other. But Superman mm-hmm. and Superboy... Or Supergirl. A Supergirl. It's just... It, I don't know. It just not, never quite clicked as much. Or Jimmy Olsen. Not, I don't know. It's not quite the same yeah. dynamic duo type of feeling to it. So I get yeah. what you mean. Yeah. Uh, but let's jump into it. So the first comic we're going to go into is obviously the very first appearance of Robin in Detective Comics number 38 from April 1940. I will show you the cover right here real oh, quick. Oh, shit. For the YouTubers. So, so it's yes, Detective Comics, 10 cents. Robin the Boy Wonders right in the first page yeah. ever of him. He's got the uh, nickname already. Yes. And uh, he's considered to be the sensational character find of 1940. <laughs> <laughs> which okay. you know I'm not really going to argue with because look how long he's fucking lasted but right. uh, if you notice the way that Robin is illustrated for those who are listening you'll have to look take up to the uh, find the image yourself but it's illustrated in a very medieval type of text right right which Jerry Robinson is also paying tribute to the Robin Hood influence here that is so interesting man yeah it's that's right cool. on the cover yeah uh, so we start in Haley's Circus uh, and a little known fact is that the circus where Grayson's perform the Grayson's perform before they die does not actually take place in Gotham oh it's performing in the outskirts of Gotham in a town out just outside of it but it's not actually in the city okay so this is something that obviously gets retconned later on but at, at this current time it doesn't even take place in Gotham um, so in the classic origin uh, this boy Dick Grayson overhears that uh, the circus is getting extorted. Specifically, the circus owner, Mr. Haley, of Haley's Circus, of course, uh, is meeting with a bunch of gangsters who have basically crashed into his office and demand protection money. And, of course, he refuses to pay up. So, okay. naturally, what is going to happen ends up happening. So, we go to that <laughs> fateful night. The Graysons perform, and Bruce Wayne happens to be in the audience. So, this is how, of course, it gets to Bruce's attention because he just happened to be at the circus at the time. Uh, right. Dick is not actually shown performing in the original comic, implying that his part of the act is probably over or he hasn't gone up yet. It's mostly just his parents. Okay. Uh, So right off the bat, his parents are John and Mary Grayson, and they're performing up in the air, and the ropes break, and they fall and are killed instantly as they fall to their deaths. And uh, a traditional part that gets overlooked is Dick uh, goes for comfort from the uh, circus ringmaster, uh, who stops him from looking at the dead bodies. This beat okay. is actually carried over in several versions, uh, but is later kind of just deleted later on. But in many retellings, you have this like ringmaster who's like holding him back from like seeing the bodies. It and makes everything. people wonder, like, what's that guy doing? Where's he? You know, I don't yeah. know. Maybe they place too much importance on 
a side character, but I I don't know. I think that's a good beat though. It is is a good beat because it shows that you know Dick does have other friends or people he considers to be family in the circus. Uh, and you'll right. see variations of this ringmaster character actually come about as we dive further into this evolution. Um, later on, Dick overhears the same mobsters talking to Haley, just being like, well, you should have paid up on it. And Dick <laughs> realizes that these mobsters are the ones who murdered his parents or basically found some way to sabotage the ropes. And he plans to go to the police until he is stopped by Batman. Oh, so shit. this is the first meeting of Batman and Dick Grayson Grayson, just on page two of this fucking comic. Oh, wow. Uh, and Batman shares that you're not going anywhere because the gangsters who killed the great, the gangsters who killed the Graysons uh, are owned by Boss Zuko, who owns this town. And, of course, this town is not referring to Gotham, but is referring to the town right. outside of Gotham. Um, uh, and obviously, before has, Bloodhaven and all that shit. Right. Yeah, Bloodhaven yeah. doesn't even exist at this point in 1940. Yeah. Uh, but he investigated already and noticed that acid was used on the ropes to make them basically break and burn. Uh, okay. So in the very first version, it's acid that's used to break the ropes. Later on, we'll see versions where it was cut uh, or other variations, but in the original, it's acid. Okay. Uh, he then takes Dick to the Batmobile uh, where he basically is talking to him and he brings up that he reminds, the boy reminds him of himself because his parents were also killed by a criminal. And that's where Dick is like, I want to help you take down Zuko. And Batman is like, well, I live a pretty dangerous life, but sure. And just immediately from then on, Batman takes him in as his uh, ward and trainee in crime fighting. So put on these green shorts, (laughs) red shirt. Yes. (laughs) That looks good, Uh, Dick. We see there's a nice beat in here where Batman and Dick are by a candle and having their palms up <laughs> to swear a vow. They're at candlelight. Okay. Part. Okay, yeah. I gotcha. He swears them in. He he swears them in, which is, we don't see in a lot of different versions. I We certainly haven't seen that in the live action adaptations, but this is a callback to Bruce Wayne's vow because in the original version of the origin by Bill Finger, Bruce is praying by candlelight as he vows to take down all evil. So he's basically having Dick Grayson make the same vow that he did. This is the I up. shall become a bat. Ooh, this is before I shall become a bat. This okay. is like I shall uh, spend the rest of my life warring on all criminals okay. type of vow. Uh, and so okay. he, he swears Dick in, and then we have this whole training montage. Again, this is still page two. <laughs> <laughs> of the comic. Were, were comics more condensed in this way back then? Oh, back yeah, then? because they had less pages. So right? Okay. I can see if I can uh, show you right here, but uh, pretty Get much this story one. moving. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, technically page three. So page one. Page one, for those who are YouTubers, can kind of see that we got, again, the introduction of Robin and then a panel of the circus performance. And then the next page is pretty much just the death of the Graysons. They, it's moving. Yep. Yeah. And then page three is literally everything from Batman meeting Dick to taking him to the Batmobile to a training montage ending with Dick in the Robin suit. <laughs> it's like page two, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, uh, that's good. I like that. <laughs> so it's basically just three or four panels of this training montage where Bruce sees Dick doing acrobatics. And he's like, you could teach me a thing or two about acrobatics. So already it's cemented like what his skill is this kid uh and bruce is also teaching him boxing and jujitsu over what's supposed to be many months of training and then final panel of that of that uh, page is dick in the robin outfit already so right right uh, uh so a few things there is no real explanation for the outfit yet <laughs> he's kind of just randomly in it um so pe- people people probably didn't like really care about do you think they really... Well, maybe they did. I don't know. No, I mean, not really. There was no explanation for why Bruce was dressed as a bat until a few issues in, but not in the first issue. Yeah, they. I don't know. Yeah, I think now audiences expect all that laid out, but I, yeah. I wonder if at that time we they just... We need Morgan Freeman to give him a costume. Yeah. Have a suit in the closet. <laughs> He's going to order several parts from China and then yeah, spray paint exactly. over them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but uh, people might be like, well, doesn't the Robin outfit in different versions later on, doesn't that outfit come from the Graysons, from the circus performance? And the answer is no. Right. If you look at the original comics, John and Mary Grayson are wearing very different outfits. Mary Grayson is in this like green bikini-looking getup. John right. Grayson has like a red top and like black and blue shorts that neither of them are in the red and green and yellow Robin outfit at this point. 
it would that call too much his his secret costume would call like cause too much connection between him and that that, that family. is my problem that is my problem yeah. with that idea uh, right because people are just like that's a good explanation i'm just like is it because <laughs> like anybody who saw the flying graces perform would just be like oh there's that kid in that familiar looking outfit that must be the same kid whose parents were killed by boss zuko and got exactly adopted by bruce wayne that part's not just happened to you know <laughs> yeah it's not thought thought out too well that right there yeah, yeah. i mean yeah not everything's got to be super realistic but yes that's uh We'll, we'll yeah. continue going off of that. We'll, I'll yeah. I'll cite in that won't come about honestly until towards the end of this episode in terms okay. of when that came about. Uh, Robin Hood's name, I mean Robin's name is not really explained either. However, the connection to Robin Hood is sort of explained in the narration. In the first mm. panel or on the first page, it describes Robin as a daredevil who scoffs at danger, like the legendary Robin Hood whose name and spirit he adopted. So okay. there's the acknowledgement of Robin Hood. Um, later issues would continue this. Detective Comics number 40, two issues later, would say would call him the young, laughing Robin Hood of today. And then way later, Detective Comics number 116 would call Robin Hood as Robin's famous namesake. Okay. So already we got the connection of Robin and Robin Hood uh, kind of in the text and not just in the behind-the-scenes inspiration. Right, right, right. That's good. The rest of the plot of this issue is on taking down Boss Zuko, of course, uh, who is going to evolve in different ways, just like the Robin origin. So in this version, the original version, Boss Zuko is based off of Edgar G. Robinson, the classic film noir gangster uh, actor. And uh, he's just basically this fat guy who keeps, he says, see, after every single thing he says, they already had the Batman, see? They already had these tropes, even in the 30s. Yeah. It's like so, <laughs> so, so early on. Like they yeah, just, yeah. the talkies have just come around and they yeah already have this shit like <laughs> it's just wild yeah. man it's wild yeah uh this culminates in a fight on top of a half done construction building that's basically made of girders and this actually inspires the opening sequence of the btaz episode robin's reckoning where oh, batman shit. and robin are fighting a bunch of guys on the construction building and it also feels like it may have inspired the finale to dark man because the end of dark man has the villain him and the villain fighting in that scenario as well so that might I rented, come from this i rented dark man on vhs uh, oh man <laughs> back in the day way back in the day watched it liked it i think and i don't remember any of it <laughs> i just i have to go back and see it again next I, deep dive <laughs> i i have seen it i you know i was i was into it but it was sam nice. raimi too right sam raimi yeah his yeah. first technically his first superhero movie yeah really. that's cool uh, Another detail that gets lost in pretty much any other version is that Zuko himself was not the one who put the acid on the ropes. Zuko's main henchman named Blade was the one who put the acid on the ropes. Wesley Snipes! Wesley Snipes kills the Graces. <laughs> is that <laughs> why Batman he went to Robin, <laughs> it wasn't Robin take him in for tax evasion? It wasn't tax evasion, it was that. <laughs> <laughs> it was for killing the Graces. <laughs> who knew? Oh man, crossover. Uh, so Blade wasn't killing vampires, he was killing the Graysons, and so he confesses to that. And uh, Zuko was like, you're not supposed to talk, you rat, and he kills him. <laughs> and Robin takes the picture of Zuko killing the guy, and that's what sends Zuko to the electric chair. Uh, Zuko's so a good name that lives up to today. Like, it doesn't <laughs> yeah. need to be changed. Like, it's a good boss, my, yeah. my boss name. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, it almost feels like Batman and Robin kill in this because they're kicking a lot of mobsters off the girders. <laughs> I think a lot of them are falling to their deaths. <laughs> He's carrying so, guns sometimes. I mean, this, this is, is they before, just yeah. This is before the no kill rule. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it almost feels as well that they set up Blade to get killed by Zuko just so that Robin could get that picture of Zuko as evidence. It almost feels that way. It's not explicitly sta stated, but that's what it feels like. Okay. Uh, and then at the end of the issue, Bruce is like do you want to go back to the circus life? Because now your parents are avenged. And Robin's like, Psh, no, my parents would want me to fight crime. I don't know why his parents would want him to fight crime. Yeah, I'm with. I'm staying with you, Bruce. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you and me are a team for life. So uh, very quickly, this version from Detective Comics number 38 would be retell, retold many times. In 1945, Batman number 32 is retold again by Bill Finger who had done the previous one. I'm going to uh, help you kill your your parents' killer. <laughs> <laughs> now that we're done with mine, I'm joining your crusade. What's, what's notable is <laughs> that in this retelling of Batman number 32, they say that Robin is, quote, named after another winged creature, 
So this is the first instance of Robin being tied to a bird as opposed to Robin Hood. Okay, so this is what issue? How how many issues are we in? Batman 32. This is like five years later. Five years later. Then we get to the winged creature thing. We get winged creature. Uh, and then another issue, World's Finest number 65. Dick says, quote, the partner of Batman will need to have wings too. How about me being a Robin? Okay, yeah. So... This is our first. They got change. lucky after the fact, yeah. I think. Like they yeah. thought of Robin Hood, they're like, "Oh yeah, <laughs> the bird." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of our first diversion. Even though in the actual uh, Detective Comics number thirty-eight, they never actually say like Batman uh, and Dick Grayson never actually talk about Robin Hood. It's only in the narration. So you could give it. There's some plausible deniability that, like, okay, like it's in the con- in the actual story, it's supposed to be a bird, okay. Even though there's a Robin Hood connection, uh, and so Robin is born, and most would say that's the first exposure to Robin's origin for a long time. But uh, the first adaptation of Robin's origin was not in Batman the Animated Series, nor was it in Batman Forever. It was actually over the radio, and oh. we will cover that after the break. Um, Bruce, I was wondering, I saw a special item. I don't even know why you weren't hiding it, but it was, uh, sort of a green blade. Yes. And green katana in your, in your armory. It's my new katana. Isn't it fucking sweet? Yeah, so it's, it's really shiny. I didn't step too, too close to it, but, uh, uh, I could, I could see, you know, I see far away and, uh, I was wondering where you got it. Why do you want to know? Well, it just seems like, you know, you had enough swords. Where, why'd you get the extra one? Let's just say that this is a custom-made sword. I thought it would be coming in handy for any future use. And could you tell me why, it's, uh, why it glows? Well, naturally, that comes from what it's made from. And what it's made from? Yes. Bruce, oh, buddy, oh, pal. It's, uh, I mean, it's kryptonite, isn't it? No, Clark. Why? Why would you think that? Well, it's 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 glowing green, and uh, I I felt a little bit just you know even ten feet away from it, Bruce. I'm sure that's psychosomatic. Anything that glows green is going to make you feel that way. It's the association of kryptonite, naturally. You know, you could have put it in a lead case somewhere. I've already entrusted you with kryptonite somewhere else. You have it on display. On the mantle, <laughs> what is going on here, Bruce? Okay, Clark, honestly, yes, it is kryptonite. I just wanted to show it off because I thought it was fucking sweet. And Selena, Selena really likes it, okay? Do you really need to show off a blade that can kill me to have sex with Selena, Bruce? Really? That's what keeps the relationship going. C- here, I, I, I've, made, I've made you a case, Bruce. I made you a lead case for it. It looks like, you know, sort of Asian and... It's, it's a Japanese case. Pretty cool. Here's a gift from me to you. I like to walk around Wayne Manor freely. Let me get this straight, Clark. You're may- you see that I have a weapon made from the very thing that can weaken you and kill you. And your response is to give me a proper box for me to put it in? I just want to not look at it anymore. Okay, fine, Clark. But can I show you some sweet moves first? <sighs> Fine. I'll look at you from a distance and and sure, whatever. Just use your telescopic vision. Yes. It's really fucking sweet. I'm gonna leave the case here, okay? Here it is. Carved by my heat vision. Thank you, Clark, for the case. Never gonna use it. Alright everybody, if you like that sketch right there, we have that plus news, plus we're bringing back some opinion pieces and uh, review type stuff and all kinds of stuff in our $5 tier on patreon so just go to patreon.com slash superhero stuff pod and if you become part of the five dollar tier you can see these new bonus episodes basically consider it superhouse dlc oh hey this is cole vallis tommy elliott and hush from the fox tv show gotham and you're listening to superhouse everything you need to know batman all right welcome back to the edition of what's the origin of dick (laughs) <laughs> in our uh, special 80th anniversary. I've always wanted to know. Robin. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we covered before the break, obviously, the very first appearance of Robin, as well as the first sort of divergence, a first change uh, in the origin, a very minor one. 
But now we're going to cover the first adaptations of Robin. And uh, the very first adaptation or attempt at an adaptation was something we covered in our Patreon episode on the unmade Batman radio shows. Uh, so basically, and I've mentioned this in our uh, Ben Cave episode as well. This is from 1943. It was a story called The Case of the Drowning Seal. And in this version, Robin's parents are still acrobats, but they're also undercover FBI agents. <laughs> this is getting uh, okay. <laughs> And sure. They end up getting murdered by Nazi spies. Convoluted as hell. Okay. <laughs> so uh, this is again uh, a very different take. I don't know. I don't have a copy of the script. All we know is that Nazis killed the Graysons. I don't know if it's still the whole acid thing. I don't know if it's a different variation. They still right. kept the acrobats, but that's about it. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, there was probably a time where damn near every single bad guy ever was a Nazi, <laughs> and it sold like crazy. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was 1943, the first attempted or uh, adaptation on the origin of Robin, and it would have been a pilot for a Batman radio show, and you can check out our Patreon, uh, the $5 tier, you can have access to all of the Patreon episodes, uh, but there, uh, Andrew actually reads off what was supposed to be the script for Batman, the Batman equivalent to Superman's faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than locomotive, uh, that stuff. So it's uh, it's amazing it exists. Out. I yeah. would say not to spoil it, but it's not as good as Superman's. Yeah, no. I agree. So there's <laughs> a reason it's sort of lost to time, but it is interesting yeah. that it exists at all. Mm -hmm. so, so that was the first attempt at an adaptation, but it was not the only adaptation over radio for it uh, as we covered in our Superman radio deep dive the radio Superman is the best Superman uh, around 1946 there was a story called the dead voice that had Batman revealing the Robin origin to Superman he actually calls him up in the middle of the night and Clark at first answers in a Superman voice where he's like hello and then he's like <coughs> hello <laughs> and, and Batman's like, make up your mind. Are you Superman or Clark Kent? So that's <laughs> that's kind of funny. It's so they give him, the more, a, they actually give him a good line. I heard one of the more Batman-like lines of uh, the Batman in that radio show. So check out that episode if you guys haven't already on uh, <laughs> why, even though Radio Superman was the best Superman, uh, Radio Batman was probably the worst Batman. Uh, <laughs> but in, he seems to do okay in this version. So, so. take that, Clooney haters. <laughs> Bruce has Clark come over to Wayne Manor and he, he basically recaps the origin of Dick Grayson's, uh, how Dick Grayson became Robin. Right. Uh, so why is he showing his legs off? <laughs> I won't explain that to you, Clark. Let's talk more <laughs> about how he, how his parents died. So Well, I, think, I don't even care about that, Bruce. <laughs> I'd rather, what's going on with the legs? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in this version, Dick Lost. This is the first time that we get an age for how old Dick Grayson was when his parents died. There's no specified age in the uh, Detective Comics number 38. Uh, so here he specified to be eight or nine around. God, the time that. it's that young, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so 45 year old Chris O'Donnell's way <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah, uh, and he by the time that Superman works with him and Batman in the show, he's 14. So he's super okay. Young. Yeah, uh, a fourteen. Uh, I'm. I wouldn't be surprised about, but eight yeah. or nine. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so, Dick Grayson was always voiced by a, an actor named Ronald List, who was definitely older than fourteen, but he had a very youthful sounding voice. Mm -hmm. uh, and this adaptation, I I couldn't find a writer, but I believe it might have been Ben Peter Freeman, who also wrote a lot of the radio episodes that became the basis for the Kirk Allen serials. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, in this version, Bruce actually knew the Graysons and was a good friend of theirs and considered them to be the top high wire aerialists of all time. So they aren't trapeze artists in this version. They're walking and doing stuff on a high wire in, okay. uh, in the radio adaptation, which is very interesting. Still uh, fine. I mean, you could take the net off the bottom and they're still dead. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I just think it's an interesting. It's the only time where they've yeah. changed that. So that's right, interesting. Right, and he's right, like, right. I'm something of an amateur aerialist, my, aerialist myself. But this is like the first version where Bruce actually knows the Graysons before they die, which is interesting. Right. Um, also, the first instance where Dick meets Bruce before he meets Batman. Okay. Uh, so Dick is actually in the audience with Bruce while this is happening, and they're watching the performance. And it's in front of like 15,000 people. And right. so, as a little treat for you guys, I decided to pull up a bit of a sound clip that we're going to play now of the very first time they adapted the Robin origin. So, here we go. 
And bending on his knees, John Grayson swung his young wife behind and above him, where she landed gracefully on his shoulders. For a split second, he was unbalanced, and then he steadied himself. With his wife standing on his shoulders, he started walking along the wire. That was when it happened. Suddenly, without warning, the wire snapped and broke in the middle. I heard a scream. I think it was Mrs. Grayson. The two ends of the wire were dangling in midair like long, thin snakes, and the white figures were plummeting down to the ground. And nice. that's the death of the Graysons. So it's very much done through Bruce's narration, as you heard, and sound effects. But here's another big change. When they get there, the mother's already dead, but John Grayson is still alive. Oh, shit. Fall. And Bruce goes to the dying John Grayson. And I don't know who voiced John Grayson, but whoever it was, it was the first actor to ever play John Grayson. It might have been Jackson Beck, who was the narrator, and usually took on a lot of the different... Uh, different characters, as well as was one of the co-founders of Afra. <laughs> so check out our Patreon deep dive on uh, right, right. Flights of Fantasy, where we talked about that. But uh, John Grayson basically tells Bruce to take care of his son in his dying words. Wow, and Bruce okay. Agrees. So Bruce taking on Dick as an apprentice is to help fulfill a promise to the dying John Grayson in the radio. Okay, version. Well, that's not not that bad. Not in any other version. So I'm like, this is amazing. Um, and his other dying words is to tell Bruce a clue where he says, this wasn't an accident. This was murder. You're, and then he dies. You're Bruce Wayne, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You're like, you're rich as fuck. Uh, uh, yeah. Please take care of my son. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Now, the other thing is that he, I guess, wants to tell Bruce that this was a murder and to like make sure that whoever did it goes to justice it was an so, inside job see it was an inside job <laughs> oh it's other guy <laughs> that's boss zuko and yeah. funny enough boss zuko is not in this version so this is the first time that someone other than zuko kills the graysons it is ironically the ringmaster remember i said the oh. ringmaster would come back the ringmaster who comforts him in the comic in this version that guy's the bad guy complete change so, huh okay uh, this ringmaster is named eric larson in the first episode, he was named George Larson, but I think that's because the previous villain in the Superman show was named George Latimer, and they just got the Georges mixed up in terms of who the villains were. But his, <laughs> his name throughout it... Who's a villain Eric in this Larson. picture again? <laughs> is it Eric or George? <laughs> yeah. Who is it? <laughs> uh, and so the explanation, is Batman investigates, and he goes through John Grayson's diary as well as talks to Dick Grayson, and he finds out what really happened here. Why did the Ringmaster kill the Graysons? So... John Grayson was still named John, but Mary Grayson was changed to Yvonne because they wanted to create this connection, as we'll see. So remember when I said the case of the Drowning Seal had the whole Nazis kill the Grayson sort of thing? Yeah. Well, uh, because this is 1946, they wanted to have some sort of connection still to the whole World War II and Nazis. Of course, this is post-World War II, but this story takes place during it. Yvonne's okay. family is part of the French resistance at this time. And oh, the ringmaster sure. finds out and decides to blackmail them for money, basically saying that he'll expose her family members' identities to the Nazis so that the Nazis will kill her family unless they don't pay him. Uh, unless they pay him. Okay. Pretty much. That's interesting. So a more complex, more personal uh, thing, because beforehand in the comics is just literally like, let's strike at the circus, and they just happen to go after the Graysons. You wish they, they brought this over more uh, in more recent versions? You'd like to see this brought, brought back more? Maybe not the French Resistance Nazi thing, but something that's a little bit more personal. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it makes a little bit more sense. Um, but, yeah. I mean, some people like the whole randomness to the deaths of the Waynes and the Graysons. Um, but uh, I, in some ways, it does make a lot of sense in this version. At Bruce the Bruce Wayne's parent the parent the Wayne's dying can be more or less random. Well, in later versions like with Telltale and all mm -hmm. that, like that's obviously a little bit less random. But mm -hmm. let's say Bruce random, but but Dick is not random. I don't know. Dick is definitely coming from some sort yeah. of mob hit. You know. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And this one it was more personalized to the Graysons as opposed to the comic where it was just kind of like let's just hit the circus as a I, warning. I wonder how if there was any kind of precedent at all for the mob being associated with the circus back in mm. the day because again we've talked about this before we kind of made fun of it but like at this time this is the 30s there's not even tv right 
like fucking TV. Right. It's just radio. It's just radio. And, uh, you know, it's just radio and comic books. So, like, people getting their entertainment from traveling circuses, like, it's a thing. Like, I feel yeah, like especially yeah. younger younger kids with comics today, they don't really realize what the circuses probably were. And maybe we even don't. But it just seems like the circus was such a bigger thing back then. Yeah. You yeah, know? Definitely. So they kind of always have to update it. A lot of the updates, as we'll go into, is it's some sort of charity performance type of thing. I mean, the closest like it makes thing, a bit more sense. Closest thing now is Cirque du Soleil or some shit like that. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? A traveling yeah. Cirque du Soleil. Mm-hmm. Not uh, always in here, Vegas. Yeah, here the Graysons did not want to pay Larson and instead decided to expose his expose his blackmail, threatening to go to the district attorney to have him arrested, and so. Uh, Larson killed them instead by cutting the high wire. Oh, shit. So, basically, Batman works with Dick Grayson in order to provide this evidence to the court, and Larson gets sent uh, for only 10 years, which seems very light uh, over here. Uh, But Larson says that he'll get Dick Grayson for this, and then Larson, apparently, the whole plot of the Superman episode, I'm not going to get too much into it, but the plot of the Superman episode is that Larson has called to threaten Dick Grayson. And Superman's like, well, that makes sense. But Bruce is like, you don't understand. Larson has been dead for months. Oh, shit. And that's why it's called the dead voice. Uh, But we won't get into that. You guys can check out the Superman radio episode where I talked a little bit more about that episode. Uh, But the stuff about Robin's origin is done. Uh, And this would be the one and only annotation of Robin's origin until 1993 with Batman the Animated Series. Wait, so from what year to 93? 1946. Oh my god! There would People be no just... the the serials don't cover Dick Grayson's origin. The '66 show with Burt Ward and his giant package do not cover <laughs> the origin of Robin. None of the other cartoons, Super Friends, cover Robin's origin. He's already Robin in all those other adaptations. The Superman radio show was the only adaptation for decades until Batman the Animated Series. Once you see the package. So, so large. <laughs> you just don't need any explanation. <laughs> okay. So, that those were adaptations. And those will be, funny enough, the only adaptations we cover for this part because we got a lot of other comic book stuff before we wrap up. Uh, okay. We, get, we end up getting a new explanation for why Robin's name is Robin as well as the first explanation of where Robin's suit comes from in 1955. Oh, shit. Okay. So, uh, and I've discussed this comic before in our Batman training timeline but there was a story called When Batman Was Robin by Edmund Hamilton art by Dick Sprang and Charles Paris that has is the first comic to explore Batman's training and it has Bruce Wayne wanting to learn from a detective named Harvey Harris but he's like I'm already this rich kid I don't want him to know my identity so I'm going to go in disguise and so he sews his own suit based off of uh, his training from the Sea Scouts uh, he sews his own red and green suit to keep himself anonymous and shows up in the future Robin costume to save Harvey Harris. And Harvey calls him, quote, as brilliant as a Robin Redbreast. And so he's like, I think I'll call you Robin. And so in this continuity, in the Silver Age, Robin was Bruce's first identity when he was training. And the name Robin comes from his mentor and all Bruce did was pass along the costume and the name to Dick Grayson yeah how do you feel about that (laughs) uh well it's very convenient (laughs) like it's yeah it it seems like um, a big to be fair again at this time no real explanation behind where the suit even comes from not a lot about where the name Robin comes from other than just uh pick another winged creature so i get the mentality at the time and of course this is the silver age where like it was kind of like let's come up with like these weird wacky concepts to get people to buy the comic like weird ideas so the idea of bruce being the first robin is a very weird idea and it got incorporated in a retelling in batman 213 by e nelson bridwell or by ross andrew and mike esposito in 1969 where it basically just showed uh Bruce giving the suit to Robin and naming him Robin with a one panel flashback of him as Robin with Harvey Harris. So there's something uh, about it like get, just getting Bruce's hand me downs. I don't know. I like him having his own yeah, suit. I agree. I guess. I agree. Mm-hmm. Unless there was like a long a longer extended thing of him kind of 
being Robin by himself as a kid. I don't know. Yeah, mm. something about that doesn't work. I don't know what it is. It, something it in remove, my gut, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> it does remove the feeling of him, I guess, picking his own identity. Yeah, 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 mean, right? something like basically that, I guess, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up with that explanation because that also got retold in the Untold Legend of the Batman, and that was one of the first uh, comics or takes on the origin that I ever was exposed to, but uh, it's very Silver Agey, it's, it's very dated, it's not something that you would see a lot, unless we do my version that I pitched in the training timeline, where if we combine all these versions, Bruce Wayne, when he's training, undergoes acrobatics training, from John Grayson, who has the different tiers of acrobatics in the first tier, right. the sort of tenderfoot or private in the military, is being a Robin. Okay. And so the name Robin is not necessarily a personal family thing, but more of like a family tradition of the different ranks that you would go through. Yeah. And so yeah. Batman adopts that idea of the trainee's name is Robin, just like I was a Robin and just like Dick was a Robin when he was undergoing training from his parents. And that's okay. why Dick would also be okay with the fact that Jason Todd and Tim Drake and Damien and Stephanie Brown and Carrie Kelly all take on the Robin name because it's not like a personal name that his family gave him, which is the explanation in the modern versions, but is the idea of being the trainee. Right. Yeah, that, that makes a little bit more sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't think Bruce would necessarily be wearing the same exact Robin outfit when he's doing this, but... It, if he is, it would still be because the Graysons have that as their training outfit, which would still keep it within Dick's family, as opposed right. to it being Bruce's that he then uses as a hand-me-down over to Dick. It's an internal family thing that Dick reveals to him so mm -hmm. that not everybody knows that it's a... So, you know, the costume can't trace him back to the flying Graysons. Yeah, it could right? just be something that he wears when he's in practice or something like that. Or okay. just, or like it's just maybe it's not even with the cape. Maybe it's just with the red and the green. The shorts, though, you got to have those and the gloves. <laughs> <laughs> the yes. booties. It's the pixie <laughs> boots. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> fucking pixie boots, dude. They're yeah. drawing this yeah. back in what 1938 or whatever the fuck. Like, guys, <laughs> this is badass. 1939, 1940. Yeah. Yeah, this is badass. Look you at this. Thank Jerry Robinson for it. Yeah. <laughs> hey Bob. Uh, hey Bill. Come over here. But this in is pretty all, in cool all huh? versions. In all versions, it still remains the same in terms of the Graysons die. It was because it's boss Zuko. Batman and Robin take him down. And this seems to be there to stay for about 40 years in the comic continuity, if we discount the whole radio adaptation. Uh, but about 40 years of this until we get to the 80s. And this is going to be our last origin for this episode. Uh, in the 80s, we get Crisis on Infinite Earths, where we basically throw out all previous continuity. <laughs> Uh, and everything gets rebooted. So you Jason complained Todd about rebirth and uh, New Fifty Two kids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it happened <laughs> way earlier. <laughs> uh, and they decide to redo Robin's origin with a lot more changes than what you got in any previous retelling. So I skipped over retellings there, where it was just another version of the same shit. Uh, and instead, we're skipping right over to Batman Year Three. Year okay. Three. Now year the most three. famous of these is, is year one, but there's actually a story arc called Batman Year Three. It's collected in Batman number 436 through 439. It's by good old Marv Wolfman, mm -hmm. uh, art by Pat Broderick and John Beatty, and it was written and uh, it was published in 1989. And I credit this story with the perception that Batman starts working with Robin during his third year. Marv Wolfman, uh, who never paid for drinks in college. Drinks at all. And always got laid. <laughs> always got laid. <laughs> His name alone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Wolfman! Hey, somebody get this guy a beer. <laughs> but, like, you commonly hear, because you probably heard this a lot, where, like, year one is where Batman debuts, of course, fights a whole bunch of corrupt cops and, and joins up with Gordon. Then year two is when he runs into all the freakish villains, like Joker and everybody. And year three is when he adopts Robin. Well, that perception comes from this comic called okay. Batman Year 3. Uh, and it's interesting because it, the there's two stories going on. There's a present-day story where Batman is in mourning over Jason Todd and Nightwing is helping him out. And they have flashbacks to Batman's third year, which covers Robin's origin. And this comic was very influential on all the other adaptations, uh, including B-Taz. So okay. I'll run you through some of the stuff that B-Taz took from Year 3. Um 
So in this version, Boss Zuko is still in it. He's given the name Tony Zuko, which is the name that he gets in BTAS. Okay. And for the first time, uh, Zuko is not portrayed as an old fat man. He's a thin young man, like he is going to be in BTAS. Okay. Uh, and in this version, Dick overhears Zuko personally threatening Haley to extort him, which again happens in BTAS, where Zuko does his own dirty work. In the original version, it was that guy Blade, Wesley Snipes. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Kids, look at who Wesley Snipes is, okay? <laughs> they shouldn't know at this point. He's not that old. Dude, Wesley, when was the last thing you saw him in? It's been a while. He went to well, prison. Yeah, he, was, he was into prison. Uh, he's in What We Do in the Shadows. He has a cameo in that. Oh, really? Well, yeah. Have you seen the show? Not in much. He had a much bigger presence in the 90s. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Uh, but, yeah. Anyway, uh, this is the first comic book instance where the Graysons are wearing the future Robin outfit as okay. part of their costume. He's uh, finally however, covering his, his gams. Uh, no, he, they're, they're still legs open. Pearly whites. <laughs> not his teeth, but rather his gams. Okay. Yes, yes. Pearly gams. Uh, this is actually not the idea. the first time, however, that they came up with the idea of the Robin outfit. Uh, being foreshadowed through the Graysons. They were actually toying around with doing that in the 1989 Batman movie. Okay. Which I will cover in our Patreon episode. But we did talk a little bit about it in our deep dive from like a year ago called Ben Reads the Batman Script from 1982. But in those scripts, that's that's where they proposed that idea. Okay. Um, I will argue, though, that it makes more sense in the live-action continuity because as we saw in Batman Forever... The, he has like the more traditional Robin outfit, but then when he's fighting crime with black rubber suited Michael Keaton or Val Kilmer, <laughs> he's going to be wearing something that is of the same material. He's not going right. to be wearing the acrobat, uh, right, the acrobat right. outfit. So there would still be enough of a difference you wouldn't be able to tell. Okay. Uh, let's see. So during this time, a young boy named Tim <clears throat> is introduced here as a fan who takes a picture with the Graysons, and it is the last picture of the Grayson family together. And wow. for those wondering, yes, this is the first appearance of Tim Drake. Wow, okay. Uh, so they were already planning to have a new Robin after Jason Todd's death, but they wanted to plant him, like they didn't want it to be super random. So they have Tim Drake here in year three before Tim Drake shows up in modern day in A Lonely Place of Dying. Uh, a Lonely Place okay. of Dying was where... Tim Drake shows up and he's already figured out that Dick Grayson was Robin because he was at this performance and he saw Robin do a move and later on Robin did the same move and he put everybody together. You would have thought he would have figured it out from the fucking outfit because they were also in red and green and yellow but you know comics everybody. <laughs> comics logic. That's for the kids. Yes. Uh, Bruce is in the audience, and at this point, they seem to have gotten rid of the idea of this being in a separate town. Now we're back in Gotham City. Okay. In year three. Uh, Dick is also called the Boy Wonder of the Circus. So okay. So a little bit of foreshadowing there. Uh, in here, the ropes are cut. It's not acid. Okay. So that's That makes... Thing. Well, I don't know. If it's slow-burning... It's just... Yeah, the way the acid works, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, whatever. It's not yeah. really something I get too hung up on, but... Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. After... Like, Grayson still die, as usual. Uh, but here's what's interesting. Batman literally shows up right after they die. Oh, not Bruce. He's, okay. He swoops down, yeah. So here, yeah. Dick's first exposure is to Batman, just like in the original. Uh, and Batman can tell that the line was cut from investigating it. And Dick tells Batman, like, he overheard that Zuko was threatening Haley, And he, you know, he promises he basically yells at batman promise me you'll kill him okay so there's no like you were too late batman nothing like that he's not like, no no bitter no okay yeah he's not bitter about that okay uh he's not chris o'donnell <laughs> okay who's yeah. like beating the shit out of him in forever. <laughs> <laughs> bastard <laughs> oh man uh so here's also what's interesting is that you would think okay cool dick's met batman batman's gonna take him in just like in detective comics 38 does not happen. Dick goes to the orphanage at this point. Uh, Gordon personally drops I'm not going to make an orphanage and Dick joke. We're just going <laughs> to skip. We're skipping past that. 
there's a uh, orphanage St. Jude's, not the same St. Jude's as the hospital, but the uh, orphanage called St. Jude's. You make that, it even uh, worse. Okay, keep that going. That Dick goes to, and <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> I don't know where you're gonna go with this. No, uh, but same orphanage apparently that Boss Zuko went to. So they uh, kind of have this interesting parallel between Zuko and Dick Grayson, where they go to the same orphanage. Uh, growing up okay uh, but unlike Zuko Dick gets a foster father in the form of Bruce Wayne two or three months later so he spends a while in this orphanage but two or three months later uh, or about yeah one to two months later uh, Bruce adopts him Dick has no idea why Bruce wants him but uh, Alfred picks him up and says you know Mr. Wayne's interested in you because his parents were killed by criminals too the other so. kids of the orphanage are like man what the fuck <laughs> yeah <laughs> Bruce is like, Fuck. well, did your parents get killed by a grisly, violent murder? Well, I'm a no. fucking orphan, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> it should be you enough. <laughs> Prerequisite is your parents have to get killed by a criminal. <laughs> That's the only way. Fuck That's the Bruce only Wayne. way I'm interested. Yeah. So Dick shows up to Wayne Manor. He's introduced to Bruce. And uh, Bruce said, you know, hey, I overheard that you yelled at Batman that you wanted Zuko dead. Is that still true? And Dick says, no, because... You know, I was hurt at the moment, but I know now it won't bring my parents back, and I just want to make sure no one gets hurt the way that I do. So Bruce something is like wrong answer, <laughs> wrong answer. <laughs> uh, no, Bruce is like correct answer because of course he didn't want like a yeah. murderer bloodlust his roof. I mean, to be fair, Dick looks like he's like ten in this, so it's not like what is he gonna do up against this mobster? Uh, but Bruce, <laughs> I'm gonna get him with my slingshot. <laughs> So Bruce hears this, and uh, he's like, all right, well, then it's time. And he goes to the grandfather clock, and he opens the door to get them into the Batcave. <laughs> um, and he brings Dick That'd be into a the cool, cave. fun reveal in a movie. Yeah, like the, yeah. The, the, Like, usually it's they a, just kind of show the Bat the bat, mo- the bat yeah. cave, but, mm-hmm. like, especially, uh, you know, scenes are done from characters' perspectives, right? Or right. Or in books or whatever. So it mm-hmm. might not always be from Bruce's perspective. So if we go in through... Um, you know, Robin's perspective into the cave. That's yeah. actually, that'd be a cool beat if that was, uh, you know, in a movie. I mean, the closest we got was when uh, Chris O'Donnell found his way into the Batcave in Batman Forever, but I realized I don't remember being right magical, age. though. It didn't That's seem true, magical. yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. It was kind of just more yeah. like, here's this gag, he's in the Batcave now. Yeah. Uh, but here, yeah, Bruce opens up the grandfather clock. He takes him into the cave, and at one point, he, like, disappears, and you just hear his voice. <clears throat> and the next time that he emerges, he's Batman. He's revealed to himself that he's Batman. And uh, he's like, do you want to help me? And Dick says, yes. And Batman says, then welcome to your new home. And Damn, so, <laughs> that's pretty good. That's pretty cool. I believe this is also the first time in the comics that we see Dick reacting to the fact that Bruce and Batman are the same guy. Because... Right. In all the previous comics and and the radio adaptation, we never covered that beat where, you know, this new adopted dad is like, oh, by the way, I'm I'm Batman or I'm Bruce Wayne if he meets Batman first. Like, that, right. that's not covered until this comic. Uh, of course, this would have been covered in the 89 Batman movie if he was in the in it and it's in the different drafts. But those weren't made. So this is the first instance of that. Right, right, right. Uh, let's see. The training montage is not just physical stuff like it was in Detective Comics 38, but it's also mental so we see see him studying and training him in computers, so that's cool. Okay. Uh, and then he awards Dick when is, the Robin. This is eighty six, you said, or something. Eighty nine. Eighty nine. Eighty nine. Okay, so we've got like yeah. some really like monochrome, you know, keep uh, computers going on. <laughs> Very thick monitors in the back. Yeah, square ass. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's then, cool though. Uh, Bruce awards Dick the Robin suit that he's modeled after his circus costume. Is he like made to study Aristotle and Sun Tzu? And, you know, uh, not explicitly, but I imagine he would. But it, it's kind of just a montage of it's probably it's. I guess they decided it would be more interesting to show some of the physical stuff. So him doing him doing martial arts as well as him in front of like a computer or reading about forensics, but probably not him sitting down and literally having the Book of Art of War on his. Uh, one desk. of my favorite training montages is the scene in a, this in the Count of Monte Cristo in like what 2002 mm, yeah. or 1 or something and like he's learning you know classic literature along with mm-hmm. fencing and and all that like we've talked about it before but that's you know I one of the best um, yeah adaptations it's transformation yeah. it's it's that that's not nearly as good as a book you said but it's a decent adaptation though right 
Would you? T- it's you a good. Like that movie? If you're going to condense it into two <laughs> into two hours, <laughs> yeah, then uh, you kind of have to do what they did. I remember just being just loving that movie, man. Mm-hmm. I have to see it again to see if it holds up. But it was. I thought it was so good. It it holds up pretty well, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, if if you if you even if you've read the book, if you're just like, look, this is not going to be the book. There's no way it can be the book because the book is a thousand pages and can't yeah. be condensed into two hours. Uh, then you know it's a fine movie. Uh, I want a 13 episode Netflix show on it, but HBO yeah. Max <laughs> or HBO Max. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> we'll, we'll continue to pitch it to HBO Max. But yeah, yeah. we uh, got a lot yeah, of he's pitches. reading. He's he's reading Machiavelli uh, in that yeah. in that part at one point. So similar things here. I, I could definitely see it in. Um, I'll cover Titans in the second part, but uh, it's pretty much implied that Bruce made Dick study Machiavelli and Sun Tzu in uh, in Titans. Okay, so, cool. Yeah, that I, makes sense. I appreciate that kind of stuff. Yeah, me too. Uh, so Dick gets awarded the Robin costume, and his debut is helping Batman take down one of Zuko's nightclubs as Robin. And this is where Robin gets to announce uh, who he is in his own, uh, instead of I'm Batman, I'm, I'm Robin. Robin. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll have, you, I'll have you read out what he says in uh, Marv Wolfman's dialogue. Robin! That's one B, like in Robin Hood, not Robin Hoods. That's what you creeps are. <laughs> ha ha. But <laughs> that's it's again another Robin Hood connection. <laughs> no one would think it's two Bs, but okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of weird, but oh well. Uh, we don't actually see Batman and Robin bringing Zuko to justice in this version. It's sort of implied uh, that he goes to jail, and then in the present day, Zuko is about to be released. And okay. Nightwing isn't too happy about it, but that's the rest of the year, year three story. We're done with the origin uh, in terms of the evolution of it. But as you might be able to tell, this is a major influence on a lot of different adaptations. So B-Taz, as we'll go into in the next episode, it had the thin Tony Zuko. It's got Dick Grayson having these friendships that we see around the circus. We have the framing story of modern day with the flashbacks. Uh, so very influential on the Robin take in B-Taz. Also influence, influential on Batman Forever in the fact that Robin's outfit is from the Graysons, which we saw. Uh, the whole training montage was in the script but was cut, as we talked about in the Batman right. Forever script deep dive. Um, as well as Titans, when Titans had the whole episode of Zuko getting released in the flashbacks. That also comes from year three. So that's it's a very influential thing. But we'll be covering all of those adaptations and all those versions next time but Andrew what do you think so far of all the different adaptations of or different versions of Robin's origin I'm surprised there was a huge jump from 46 to 86 or what was it 89 89 yeah yeah Four, I mean again that doesn't mean that they years? never sh- it doesn't mean that they never showed it it's just I read all basically every single instance I could find of Dick Grayson's origin getting recapped and they didn't make any significant changes to it until 89 the other big thing is obviously the Robin Hood connection. I just always thought it was the Robin the bird. Right. Uh, Cuz is, is the bird yeah. also red? Like I'm I'm terrible at uh, Robin, well, it's it's not green, <laughs> but it's got yeah. the red, you know, it's Robin Redbreast, so it's got it's got red on its All right. torso. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I should be better at that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, <laughs> but okay, so yeah, but I always thought it was the bird and never thought about it being Robin Hood at all. Like mm-hmm. they to me cuz I you know, we discovered Robin Hood or Robin when they, when we're kids. We don't think about all these connections, so mm-hmm. that's cool. And um, what you said about um, it really um, helping out Batman's uh, character development, especially later yeah. on, uh, mm-hmm. I think is 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 important. So yeah, and I mean, we who like comic books really like silly things. So the. <laughs> The, the the suit, you know, it's it's funny and it's silly, but, you know, it's part of the history and mm-hmm. there's something kind of, I don't know. I mean, it's it's so silly. It's one of the sillier things in <laughs> some fucking kid with showing his fucking, like, like booty shorts, basically, and pixie boots. Are you fucking kidding me? Mm-hmm. It's just ridi- <laughs> it's ridiculous, but... Yeah. But, yeah, it's fun. Robin history, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was good. I'm looking forward to the next one. Nice, nice. Well, uh... 
let's see. You guys who are behind the Patreon, uh, behind the paywall, will get the Patreon episode where I cover all the more obscure versions that did not make it, that were not part of comic book continuity. So that's those are all the different different versions of Robin's origin when they were trying to bring them in for Batman 89 as well as Batman Returns. We have the 1990s newspaper strip. We got the Young Justice tie-in comic. We got the live stage show Batman Live that was written a by second, future screenwriter of Wonder Woman. The yeah. 90s newspaper strip? Yeah, there's a 90s newspaper strip. Wow, like New York Times or, or it was uh, all over? I'm actually, I'm not sure. Actually, I'll have to look into what specific newspaper it was a part of, but uh, I have access to the whole collection of that and uh, we'll do a future deep dive in terms of that because they have some crazy ideas that may have been influential again on BTS. They're wacky. So, okay, I did not know that yes. existed at all. Okay. So, uh, and that is superhero stuff you should know. All right, guys. So, we have a few comments, uh, mainly corrections department <laughs> that we have here from our Superman deep dives that we didn't have a chance to go into last time. Uh, one comes from, uh, actually, we got the same correction from two different people. <laughs> so, that shows how much I uh, might have messed something up, you fucked up. last time. <laughs> On Twitter, user Big Daddy Julian J uh, said, "Lois does don't fuck, name don't him. fuck with that guy. <laughs> yeah. Just from his name alone." In in reference to the fact that uh, I talked about the beat where Lois brings up the name Superman, and Clark is like, "Is that what you're calling him?" Uh, and I said, "Like, you know, there's no real explanation behind the name Superman in the movie." I was wrong. Julian brings up that Lois does name him in the film, flying off after the interview. What a Superman. However, he did say, loving the breakdown, keep the greatness coming. So thank you, Julian. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you. User on U- user on the YouTube, uh, Camden, said, quote, Lois still names him Superman in the movie. He's called a blue bomb and caped wonder in the newspapers before his interview with Lois. After he drops her off at her apartment and they exchange good nights, she says, what a Superman. After a moment, she exclaims, Superman. And the headline of the interview is, I spent the night with Superman. So... Thank you guys for correcting me on that. What I should have said is that we didn't get Clark's reaction to Lois naming him Superman in the movie. Ah, uh, in there. Okay, yeah. That's I think that's yeah. what I that's what I should have said. Uh, gotcha, Camden yeah. had a second thing in there where I said that we didn't really get a date of when Krypton exploded uh, in it, and Camden corrected me that Lex Luthor actually says that it's 1948 in the movie. Uh, however, yeah. What I should have said was that the script, the original script, gave a very different year, because the script didn't have it as 1948; it had it as like uh, 1937. So okay, so still a difference in the in that movie. Yes, it can be that. I don't have a problem with that. But just as a guy that likes fucking around and playing around with sci-fi ideas, yeah, I, I do like the idea of like like Baby Clark is in some sort of stasis on the ship. And maybe he flew for eons through space on a <laughs> sea of stars. And I think, like, what if what if Krypton exploded eons ago, you know? I, I just, mm. to me, that makes it more epic. And I like that well, idea. It can be whatever for the Superman movie. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if, if, if I was making my own, if that ever happened, like, I think that I would, I would make it, like, eons ago and... Yeah. And you know, Baby Clark flew for a, for a fucking long time. That could be a variation on what they did with Supergirl. Like Supergirl right. is technically older than Clark, but she's in stasis because of in different versions of the Phantom Zone, or she's caught somewhere where she's frozen, and then like she gets unfrozen or whatever, and I then ends up on Earth. I don't claim to know anything about quantum mechanics and all that, but going like <laughs> near going like near light speed, uh, supposedly you age less. I think going at light mm-hmm. speed and gravity is not affecting you or something. Like, if you've seen Interstellar, I mean, they don't do it with light speed. They do it with gravity mm-hmm. of another planet. But, but like, that's supposedly real science. So, uh, I don't know. Again, Superman is a sci-fi character. So, mm-hmm. uh, playing with those ideas is, is just fun. Yep. Yep. Exactly. All right, and that is it for the corrections department. So thank you, uh, Big Daddy Julian, and thank you for thank you Camden for your corrections on the Superman episodes, and uh, thank you for listening. Yes, Over thank you. you. Andrew. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so we, we don't have any other comments though. That's it. Uh, uh not for this week. Okay. 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 That's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Once again, 
Thank you to Kooky Noms, Matt Herring, Elijah B, Shamrock Balls, Aaron Willett, Ian H, Dan D, Leom O, Super Inframan, and Douglas P. Join us at the Shasta Army at patreon.com slash superhero stuff pod. The Shasta Army is the one dollar tier, which gives you a shout shout out here and visually on the YouTube videos like Ben Cave and whatnot. Please check those out if you haven't already. Five dollar tier is where the rubber really meets the road, y'all. And that's when uh, you get the bonus feed, five dollars a month for generally four extra episodes a month. Um, it's a it's a whole other feed we do, and uh, so please check that out. It's we, these are deep dives generally uh, for for the main podcast, and then the deeper mm-hmm. dive for the Patreon side. So yep. um, Ben's hinted at that a few times in this episode alone. Please leave us a review in iTunes. That will be very helpful. And uh, please, uh, you know, take out your phone, open up your voice recorder app. You already have it, and then record us a little something, and then send that little something to superhousepodcast at gmail.com, and we'll put it on the show. And uh, I am Thunderwolf Drew on Twitter and Instagram. And also, I want to add a little extra one. Uh, I'm doing a little bit more on my Thunderwolf Lives, or you can call it, you can search Thunderwolf Drew as well on YouTube. And that is where I do a little bit more of my interest in all things Japan and Japanese and learning Japanese language. And um, the thing that I've done that's actually got me the most hits out of everything I've done on the internet is a documentary I've made about Japanese, the two major Japanese religions, which is Buddhism and Shinto. Um, So that's on there and there's going to be some other things on there. So check that out if you can. If there's any crossover fans of that kind of stuff out there. And uh, the other thing, of course, if you're not checking us out on YouTube here, search for superhero stuff you should know on YouTube. And that's it, Ben. Uh, you can also check us out on Instagram at superhero stuff pod, as well as Twitter at superhouse pod. Uh, and you can also follow me on Instagram at uh, Ben Juan Ryder. I do not have my own YouTube channel like Andrew does, <laughs> but maybe that'll change in 2021. Just, oh shit! Uh, really? Stay tuned. I'm uh, yeah, I'm considering a few things. That's so. news to me, actually. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> stay wow. tuned. It will be uh, unrelated to slightly unrelated to uh, the podcast, but a little bit more of uh, my own writing-related stuff. So well, we'll see. Sh- <laughs> I'm lost. I'm I'm at a loss for words. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, thank you very much for joining us, and stay tuned for part two. Signing right. off, y'all. Signing off.